Good afternoon and welcome to this special digital conversation curated by the ORF. I'm Shubhangi Pandey and I work with ORF's Strategic Studies program here in New Delhi. In today's session, we'll endeavor to explore the current status of intra-Afghan talks and the prospects for reconciliation with the Taliban, as well as the role that India could play in the current context given that India has high stakes in a sovereign, democratic, united, and most importantly, peaceful Afghanistan. We are joined this afternoon by a very special guest, and it's an absolute honor for me to introduce you to His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Hanif Athmar, the Acting Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Prior to assuming office in the Foreign Ministry, Mr. Atmar served as the National Security Advisor and also held a number of ministerial positions in diverse portfolios like education, rural rehabilitation and development, and the Ministry of Interior. Minister Atmar is also credited with introducing significant reforms in the Afghan National Defense and Security Force, the National Security Council, and the administration of the Ministry of Interior. On behalf of the ORF, sir, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. Let me also take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to Ambassador Amar Sinha, a distinguished fellow at the RIS and former Indian ambassador to Afghanistan. And of course, our very own Ambassador Rakesh Sood, distinguished fellow at the ORF and also a former Indian ambassador to Afghanistan. Thank you for joining us. Before we proceed further, just a quick announcement for those uh, who are joining us via Zoom. We will have some time towards the end for uh, you know, an audience interaction with the minister. So do send in your questions through the chat box or the Q&A function that's visible at the bottom of your screens. Um, and with that, could I please invite His Excellency Minister Atmar to deliver the keynote address. The stage is all yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words and your kind invitation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, to all colleagues who have joined us today uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to be invited by uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood and Ambassador Sinha uh, and ORF. Uh, I am uh, uh, delighted to be able to participate and thank you so much for what you are doing uh, uh, to uh, promote um, um, a genuine uh, uh, policy debate about uh, Afghanistan and its uh, uh, peace process. Uh, um, uh, uh, let me pay my respect uh, and appreciation for, for the service that the two distinguished uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, Ambassador Sena and Ambassador Sood, uh, have actually uh, uh, carried out in Afghanistan and then especially in promoting Indo-Afghan uh, friendship and uh, cooperation. I have had the honor of working with both of them uh, and we will be delighted to have them again in one way or another uh, uh, for promotion of uh, our uh, partnership and, and joint endeavor. Uh, also, on behalf of the government and people of Afghanistan, let me take this opportunity uh, to thank the Indian government and people uh, for their continued friendship and solidarity with the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we very much uh, appreciate uh, your uh, 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 a steadfast partnership with Afghanistan. Uh, I know India is one of the biggest donors to Afghanistan. Uh, it's, it's your economic assistance as well as uh, your friendship with us. Uh, you are uh, probably one of those friends who understand Afghanistan very well, who understand the pain of Afghans and the vision of Afghans. Uh, um, for our common future. So we are so grateful to, to every one of you. Um, uh, thank you for that. And let me assure you that Afghanistan uh, remains um, uh, uh, committed uh, to our friendship and, and, and partnership. Uh, I know my time is limited today, so uh, given the, 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 the questions that, that we received from ORF colleagues, 
uh, I will briefly talk about uh, four uh, issues. A, a quick update on the peace process as to where we are. Uh, second, uh, the rationale for this peace effort, why peace matters, its desirability and feasibility. Uh, third, the, the end state, the desired end state that we are seeking to, uh, uh, to achieve through this peace process. And uh, the, the more important uh, uh, topic, uh, uh, the role of India in, in, in this process. So I'll, I'll try to be as quick as, as I, I can. Uh, first, on the progress, um, uh, I am sure you've been following the process closely already. After the signing of the peace agreement between the United States and Taliban in February, Afghanistan doubled its efforts uh, to uh, ensure uh, national consensus and unification in support of the peace process. Uh, we consider ourselves as the supporters and the uh, participants of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Uh, so it's it was very much important for the government to make sure that the Afghan Republicans are united and that they, and this unity comes uh, 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 on a strong foundation of consensus uh, and, and commitment. Uh, to, to achieve this uh, um, con national consensus and unification, uh, four things happened. One uh, was uh, 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 a political agreement uh, uh, to accept the election result and uh, uh, build an, an inclusive uh, government. Um, uh, uh, second was uh, an agreement on uh, building a high council uh, for national reconciliation, uh, an inclusive body that will represent Afghan men and women and their aspirations. Uh, we, just like India, but at a smaller scale, we are a proud multi-ethnic nation. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, representation from from all parts of our nation, and especially of women and uh, the, uh, those who have uh, uh, not traditionally a strong voice in, in, in policy making of the state, to ensure their presence, it, it's a key uh, challenge, uh, and the commitment that every Afghan leader will have to deliver on. And uh, finally, uh, uh, it was about building an inclusive negotiating team on, on behalf of the Islamic Republic, uh, including the logistics it, it required. Uh, this is a 21-person strong team uh, with uh, some of our best uh, women leaders and, and, and men alike. Uh, in the team, and, and it pretty much represents Afghanistan, and we are quite confident that the team uh, has both the strong political will and the capability to uh, fulfill their role in, in this uh, extremely important national uh, endeavor. Um, then we engaged uh, the Taliban uh, uh, indirectly and also some of our regional and international partners who've been working with Taliban and we've had uh, a number of proposals and counter proposals as to how to start the process. But essentially, um, it was agreed that there will be reduction in violence and there will be uh, release of prisoners and then the uh, uh, negotiation between the government and the Taliban will start, and then the first topic will be a humanitarian ceasefire, uh, and then we, move, we will move into more substantive issues about the end state of, of the peace, i.e. the type of state system, the, the, the values, the principles, the uh, 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 all critical dimensions of, of the state building and political inclusion 
uh, and the rights of our people will all be, uh, um, uh, uh, of course, as, 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 as we've said it many, many times, these are our core values that we will do everything in our power to protect, preserve, and advance uh, through the peace process. Um, a kind of tacit agreement was reached with the Taliban, so we started with uh, the last Eid ceasefire and then some reduction in violence, but unfortunately, uh, uh, on both accounts, the Taliban have demonstrated that they, they have failed uh, uh, to reduce violence uh, and uh, to uh, deliver on uh, uh, their commitment or, or the agreement that was reached with them on the prisoners' release. The agreement was about uh, release of up to 5,000 uh, prisoners from the Taliban side and 1,000 from our side, uh, our prisoners with them. Um, there, there wasn't any name, it was a figure, and uh, it was qualified by up to 5,000. So the government of Afghanistan, as we speak, has released uh, 4,440 uh, 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 prisoners. Uh, of those uh, 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 that were listed in the 5,000 uh, list of Taliban. Um, the remaining ones, roughly around 550, are, uh, from our perspective, unreleasable at this point because a, they have committed atrocities that would be extremely difficult to justify uh, at this point by anybody. Uh, second, they are also involved in drugs, and, and third, that uh, some of our international partners have said to us that they object to the release of some of those. So, out of a goodwill, we said to the Taliban that they could introduce another list of, of their prisoners, which we could look at uh, uh, for release, uh, so that uh, the 5,000 number, though we have never been committed to, is, is achieved. Mm, unfortunately, that has not worked. They are dragging their feet on it. We hope uh, that they uh, show flexibility and their commitment to peace. Uh, because the government of Afghanistan has gone out of its way to deliver uh, on this process. Now, the challenge uh, for our international partners uh, who uh, have been genuinely supporting the peace process is uh, to engage with the Taliban and ensure compliance both with the violence reduction uh, objectives and uh, the release of uh, the prisoners and the start of the negotiation uh, between the government and, and the Taliban. Uh, that's, in a way, uh, a quick update as to where we are. Uh, we are hoping that by uh, this coming Eid, we will make some progress uh, on those two uh, critical obstacles. Now, my second point is the rationale for these efforts. Why peace? Why, why uh, uh, are we uh, doing this at this point? Uh, I mean, colleagues, uh, it's always peace is desirable in any religion, in any culture, in any uh, uh, nation's history uh, and, and future. Uh, but specifically, it's important that we look at the consensus that has emerged at national and regional level as to why peace is desirable and feasible in Afghanistan. Uh, the first point of consensus, uh, I mean, consensus from almost 20 partners we have in the region and another 20 partners that we have uh, uh, at an international level, with whom we met two weeks ago, and we had a, a very constructive engagement. India was obviously one of the most active participants um, in, in, in the process. So um, uh, let me look at five key uh, consensus points from that uh, discussion we've had. Um, point number one, the cost of the war is too high in blood, treasure, 
and opportunities, not only for Afghanistan, but also for the region. Uh, well, for reasons of time constraint, I, I, I would not go into details, but I, I know uh, this uh, uh, deserves a, a further explanation. Uh, second point, that peace with the Taliban will be extremely important for counterterrorism at regional and international level. Let me put it frankly this way. Uh, what we are dealing with is uh, um, uh, a symbiotic relationship between transnational uh, terrorist networks on one hand, transnational criminal networks on the other, and the covert foreign policy engagement uh, as, as the third element of, of, of that axis. Now, when it comes to the first uh, uh, group, the transnational terrorist network, we are dealing with four categories of them. One, that are Afghans, and we want to make peace with them. But the three others are not Afghans, and we do not have any legal or political grounds to make peace with them. These are regional terrorists such as IMU, ETIM, Jandullah, you name it. These are Pakistani terrorists such as LAT, jaish e Mohammed, TTP, and, and the rest. And third, these are international terrorists such as uh, Al-Qaeda and um, uh, Daesh, ISIL, Khurasan. Now, with these three groups, we have no reason uh, to make peace. But these three groups are exactly the source of threat uh, to the region and the international community. So if we make the assumption is, and hopefully this will be a reality, and this will have to be part of the end state, if we make peace with the Taliban, then Taliban will deliver on the objective not to harbor not to host these three other groups. So in this case, it's in the interest of Afghanistan, the region, and the world community. It is specifically in the interest of India. India and Afghanistan do not want to see these groups uh, in, in Afghanistan at all, in, in this region that would threaten our national security. So the third point is that the uh, uh, peace in Afghanistan with the Taliban would improve political and security cooperation uh, uh, at the regional and global level. Frankly speaking, I, uh, with my experience as, as a national former national security advisor and now uh, uh, acting foreign minister, I see how much those relations have been damaged by the presence of the terrorists in the region and the enormous amount of suspicion uh, that has been generated by, by uh, this fact and affected uh, foreign relations. Uh, um, so it, it's important for that. Uh, uh, the other point is obviously uh, uh, the opportunities for regional connectivity and regional economic growth. Uh, I must say that uh, we continue to believe that stability, security, and peace in Afghanistan will allow for an enormous amount of uh, regional connectivity and economic cooperation. Uh, uh, India is already assisting with this. Uh, Chabahar and uh, through Chabahar, uh, Afghanistan, Central Asia is a key connectivity and regional growth potential. Finally, uh, this piece would also allow all of us to deal with the human costs and implications of, of the conflict, the refugees, the women, the widows, the um, uh, 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 youth and, and uh, our children. I mean, uh, it's an enormous burden on Afghanistan, the region, and the international communities, uh, also with Europe. This brings me to my third issue, and that is the end state. Uh, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, uh, um, uh, this is important. 
uh, uh, because uh, if, if we are seeking peace in Afghanistan, we must agree what end state we want to see as, as, as a result of this peace. And whether that end state is acceptable to the Afghan people and to the region and our international stakeholders. Uh, let's be frank about it. We are all stakeholders in, in this peace process and we have to demonstrate that uh, uh, the interests of, of all uh, uh, um, uh, are actually reflected in that end, end state. So in the end state, I mean, the key there is that we want peace, but we want peace within the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And the Islamic Republic is defined by its core values related to human rights, women's rights, democracy, rule of law, and political inclusion. So what we have achieved over the past 20 years with great help from our friends, especially from India. I was uh, two days ago in, in Afghanistan's parliament and, and I saw that magnificent building there. Amar Sena Saab, you and I went there together to see it. A, a, a strong symbol of democracy in Afghanistan and a strong symbol of friendship and generosity from India. So uh, uh, this is important that we not only preserve our symbols of democracy, but further expand and develop uh, 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 what we have achieved in the past 19 years. So uh, with that overall goal, and plus the fact that we want to be uh, a center of cooperation in, in the region, not a, a battleground for confrontation of uh, regional actors or global actors, we, we are honestly tired of that and we've paid so dearly uh, uh, over the past, especially 40 years. Uh, so uh, uh, let me quickly highlight some of the features of that end state uh, uh, for, for my colleagues uh, who uh, have not heard it from the Afghan government directly. Uh, the first feature is the state, the, the quality of the state. We want an independent, sovereign, uh, unified state with full territorial integrity and no foreign interference. Um, number two is the, 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 the governance. Uh, there will have to be a constitutional democracy. The will of our people will have to shape uh, the uh, uh, policies, the accountability of uh, 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 our leaders, government leaders, the, our commitment to human rights, women's rights, and the rights of all of our citizens, especially our minorities. The third feature of this state will be its foreign uh, relations. On, on foreign relations, again, let me explore it in three critical areas, uh, security, political, and economic. In terms of security, uh, friends, uh, uh, because of the nature of international terrorism and, and, and its supporters, Afghanistan will have to work with every stakeholder. Uh, let me put it simply this way. I know it's oversimplification of the problem, but Afghanistan will have to work with NATO and its members on one hand, and with the uh, SEO, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization on that. India is one of our most prominent neighbor, friend, and uh, uh, colleague uh, with whom we will not only work at these two levels, uh, especially the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but also bilaterally on, on the security. So we favor multilateralism and multi-alignment in the security uh, arena. Second is political. Again, it's the same. Uh, we believe in multi-alignment and multilateralism. We definitely don't want to be part of any conflict uh, in the region or globally, uh, but we want to work with everybody on our common interests. Common interests and common threats will have to be the basis uh, for, for that cooperation. I know I'm not naive uh, to believe that this will be simple, 
but I am absolutely confident, given the experience of our 40 years, uh, that without cooperation on common uh, interest to uh, 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 neutralize common threats, there's absolutely no way that there will be a winner and a loser. We will be all losers in this. Finally, economically, as I said, Afghanistan's vision is uh, uh, to have uh, uh, that economic uh, relations with the region and allow for regional connectivity and economic growth. I know I'm running out of time, colleagues, so this brings me to my last point, which is India's role uh, in this, and often our friends ask us about it. Uh, these are my personal views, but I can safely say that they, they, they are consistent with, with the state policies. Uh, six things I would propose uh, for uh, India's role uh, in, in the peace process. First, preserve your friendship and your partnership and solidarity with us. And no matter what is thrown at us, but if we are together, we have a better chance of success. Second, please agree with us on the end state. Let's have a constant dialogue Afghanistan and India will have to agree on an end state if they are to work together for a desired outcome uh, from the peace process. It's so important that we, within our strategic partnership agreement, that we have that dialogue and we agree on it. It, it requires a constant dialogue. Third is, we have to work together on our regional and global partners. Uh, I'll be diplomatic about it. Some of our partners are not fully aligned to the uh, end state uh, that I just described. Uh, we need to make sure that our friends are all aligned to that end state and they pursue a process an inclusive process for uh, us to achieve that end state. Uh, I would urge, and I have already done that, and I'll continue to engage my colleagues, India, the time for Indian effective foreign policy has come to push uh, strongly for uh, a peace process that will achieve the end state uh, that we agree on. Uh, I, we are already grateful to Indian support at every level, uh, particularly uh, uh, its diplomacy, uh, but I would urge both Afghanistan and India to produce a new generation of diplomatic engagement to encourage the region and our global partners to be with us for that end state of, of the peace. Um, the, uh, and the, uh, the fourth and fifth and sixth points are all pre-peace and post-peace agreement uh, uh, phases that will have to be looked at. Uh, India and Afghanistan will have to expand uh, their bilateral peace and political cooperation. There are things that India and Afghanistan can do bilaterally for peace. And, and, uh, 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 and, and they need to, it's not time here to discuss them, but they need to be discussed seriously. Uh, fifth, uh, uh, India and Afghanistan will have to expand their security cooperation, regardless of what the outcome uh, of the peace process is going to be. And finally, India and Afghanistan will have to expand their uh, bilateral and multilateral economic cooperation, uh, regardless of what outcome we, we, we are going to get uh, of the, the, the peace process. Thank you so much, colleagues. I know I'm over my time now, but I hope if the things that I have not uh, touched upon or, or will come up as questions, I will be at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Atmar, for your opening remarks. Uh, they've really set the tone for the next segment of today's session, where we're going to have Ambassador Sood and Ambassador Sinha engage in a conversation with you. For that, could I now please turn to you, Ambassador Sood, and invite you to take the floor. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhangi. 
Mr. Minister, it was a pleasure listening to you. It has been a long time since we met, and I remember how, with what clarity you used to articulate uh, projects and things like that when I was in Kabul and subsequently. And I can quite see uh, the same clarity and strength of purpose in the manner in which you have outlined the current status, the rationale for peace, and as also the end state. And uh, I think there are very, very significant messages in all of this. And of course, the six point role that you have uh, very well articulated uh, for India in this process. Um, let me, um, you know, recently we have seen an, an upsurge in the levels of violence. I think particularly what we saw in Samangan was something which was uh, heavily criticized by, uh, not just by the Afghans, but also by the international uh, partners that you have. Under these circumstances, and also coupled with the kind of changes that the Taliban have announced in their negotiating team, you know, we've seen some people being recalled from Doha, we've seen uh, Mullah Yaqub being elevated, we've seen four more additions to the Taliban negotiating team. Uh, how do you look at this? I mean, how do you assess this? Because you've had dealings, um, you have followed this process for a long time um, from the vantage point of being the national security advisor earlier and now, of course, as the foreign minister. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, as you were asking me the question and I'm making that comment, I was thinking of our lovely drive from Samangan yes. uh, uh, through Salang, and then we had uh, that nice uh, evening at your place, and we also uh, listened to Jagjit Singh, my favorite. Uh, so it was all very nice. I remember, I know it was like uh, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, oh, yes. uh, I, I, I remember vividly. And uh, we were in Samangan because India, like always, contributed uh, biscuits uh, to uh, as, as part of the food for education program of the government. I was the Minister of Education. So thank you for your service, thank you for your support, and thank you for that uh, lovely Jack Jit Singh uh, uh, session we had. Um, now, uh, um, you're absolutely right that the very same province that you and I went to 12 years ago was uh, a witness to this horrific uh, terrorist attack, uh, which cannot be justified in any way. Um, uh, and we see that uh, the, uh, there is a steady increase in, in level of violence. I mean, the average uh, uh, um, uh, casualty that we take a day above 100 a day. Uh, this is absolutely uh, madness uh, uh, and, and at a time that they say they are committed to peace and at a time that we release their prisoners. Um, so it is definitely madness. Uh, now there are changes in their leadership, there are changes in, uh, in uh, their negotiating team. Um, now uh, I uh, understand also uh, that there is uh, a, a desire for peace uh, uh, among uh, certain uh, elements there, and I hope uh, that desire for peace uh, will uh, uh, prevail and that the changes will be in support of the peace process. Uh, I hope that happens, uh, but again, we don't have any evidence uh, to suggest that these changes have either advanced the peace process or reduced the, the violence. We, we, we don't have such evidence as yet. We just hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, in fact, uh, the questions I had, uh, the minister has already perhaps preempted me and answered uh, most of it. But uh, I shall still uh, ask those. But before I ask the question, um, let me take on uh, uh, from the statement that India's role, both multilaterally and bilaterally, what we can do. Well, uh, we are uh, perhaps better placed today, at least globally, because we joined the UN Security Council. And uh, that, I don't know if the audience knows, it's entirely due to Afghanistan's uh, sacrifice, if I can say, uh, for in our favor, that they allowed this year, 2021, uh, to be availed by India. In fact, Afghanistan had announced its uh, membership uh, or its candidature uh, long before, but they then acceded to our request. And with the same uh, idea in mind that India would be in a better position to perhaps represent even Afghanistan's view on the world stage. Uh, having said that, uh, and you have made very clear uh, in terms of the end state, but you see, uh, uh, Minister Atmar, there seems to be a great debate uh, where people are looking at the Islamic Republic and Islamic Emirates as binary choices. It's either or. Uh, and we also at times get a sense that uh, the old established policy of India of supporting the Islamic Republic, its institutions, the plurality, etc., seems to have uh, passed its uh, sort of uh, shelf life and there is a need for change. We have heard voices both from within uh, the country and also outsiders. Mr. Kalilzad mentioned that we should be engaging with Taliban. Mr. Kabulov has mentioned. Uh, how do you all see that? Of course, a lot of my answers you have given in what you uh, have already said, but still I think it will be useful for the audience to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Asaip, for uh, your wonderful comments. Afghanistan will always stand by India the way you have uh, stood by us. Uh, so it's... Uh, um, second, uh, on the issue of... Um, um, uh, I mean, let me separate the two issues. One is the view on Islamic Republic versus Islamic Emirate. And second is India's engagement with the Taliban uh, that some call for. Uh, on the first issue, uh, uh, again, if we go beyond the names, it's the values, the principles, the rights of our people that will determine the type of governance structure, a political system we will have. Uh, our insistence is not on anything but those values that are the foundation for any modern society. The, the kind of values that uh, made India the largest democracy on the planet and uh, one of the fastest growing uh, 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 economies of the world. Uh, and this is something that uh, we all need to learn from. Uh, so uh, Afghanistan subscribes to those values uh, and uh, we want to preserve them and to uh, further develop them. Now, I remember at one of uh, those meetings, uh, a Taliban uh, um, a policy thinker uh, asked me a question and said, why are you prejudging this thing uh, that you want the Islamic Republic, that the Afghan people want the Islamic Republic? Uh, perhaps they also want the Islamic Emirate. Uh, if the uh, uh, key, the, the, the core value for the f to shape the future of the Afghan uh, state and society is the will of the Afghan people, then this is exactly what we need to go to. And the Taliban should not shy away from that. If they believe in the will of the people uh, to be uh, uh, the source of legitimacy, and the source of our political system and, and lead, political leadership, then we have to go to it. I strongly believe that uh, what we say uh, uh, in terms of uh, the core values uh, is uh, uh, representative of what our people think. 
So we are ready for any kind of public survey, uh, referendum, uh, any kind of public engagement uh, for our people, for our men and women alike to, to say what they want. Uh, and it's important then for all, whether it is Islamic Republic or Islamic Emirate, that they respect the will of the people and, and accept those values. That's number one. Number two, engagement between India and Taliban. I often hear this as well. Um, uh, well, whatever you do, you are such a friend that we will always trust you. Uh, but if there is a recommendation for us to make, uh, do that only when uh, the result is advancement of peace and uh, the achievement of the end state. Uh, uh, so make it conditional upon that, uh, whether it is through the process or at uh, 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 the level of outcome. Uh, it's important for India, and, and this would be the, uh, probably the only way to justify uh, uh, your engagement uh, uh, to your people uh, and to your friends like Afghans, uh, that the end state is the core objective and the end state is not only in the best interest of Afghanistan, its stability, security, and prosperity, but the end state is also in the best interest of India and, and the region. So any political engagement, any diplomatic interaction uh, will have to be informed by that goal and, and that principle. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, if I may come back, um, you know, you also emphasize that one of the one of the important uh, obligations for the Taliban has been to stop hosting the regional and the global terrorist groups that you mentioned and you spelt it out. Uh, we saw a report, you know, recently by one of the United Nations sanctions committees which said very categorically that they have not, at least it covered the period not up till June, but it covered the period up till March, April. And it said that they did not see any evidence. In fact, they cited a number of meetings that had taken place between uh, Taliban leaders as well as Al-Qaeda leaders and so on. So has that I mean, how do you assess the Taliban delivering on that particular thing? Because I think that is also something which is extremely important uh, from the U.S. point of view, because the U.S. was very keen to ensure that uh, the Taliban uh, break their linkages with the international terrorist groups. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That is also one of those key issues uh, that uh, both uh, um, Afghanistan and its international and regional partners should deal with. Because as I said, the whole um, uh, uh, assumption here uh, for the peace is that it will end the presence of the international terrorists regional and international terrorists in the region. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, there is an industry uh, that produces uh, uh, terrorism, uh, and it has a whole structure of support for it. Um, that structure and industry will have to be dismantled, uh, ranging from um, uh, education, uh, indoctrination, uh, to a sanctuary, to financing, training, and provision of weapons, you name it. Um, so they need to be dismantled. So the objective of the peace process is to achieve that goal, to dismantle that uh, uh, terrorist industry. 
And the key to that is that it should not be allowed to have a foothold in Afghanistan. And for that to happen, the Taliban will have to sever their relations with them. So now the Taliban have agreed with the United States that they will do so. Uh, um, um, it's not our report, it's the UN Security Council report, so fine. Uh, they have not done it uh, as yet. Therefore, it's important for the United States, Afghanistan, India, and our regional partners to look at conditions-based implementation of that agreement. That agreement with the Taliban will have to be informed on the conditions to be assessed independently, verified independently, and then action to be taken. If without that uh, uh, assessment, clear-eyed assessment of what is happening, uh, decisions are driven by other uh, um, priorities or other considerations, I don't think we will achieve the goal. Uh, we can certainly achieve some tactical gains here, here or there, but we may not achieve the goal. And we have experienced that. Uh, mm. After the fall of uh, Dr. Najibullah's regime, uh, then our West partners said, okay, that's enough. We are going our way. It's no longer important for us. Uh, and what they ended up with is uh, what we have now. Uh, um, so it's important that we see this through. Uh, we have sacrificed all of us dearly for this. And it will not be uh, in any way a good thing uh, to allow those sacrifices to go in vain. Uh, it will haunt us. It will come back to us. So uh, the point I'm trying to make that we have very high respect for our international partners, chiefly the United States, India, NATO, uh, and our other partners in the region. Uh, but we hope uh, that we all stay together uh, let me again stress this point. Without a full regional and international consensus and support for the peace and the end state and the goals we talked about, there's absolutely no way we can achieve it. We therefore urge India to play that big uh, regional and global role. Uh, there are those who listen to us, and there are those who listen to you. Uh, and, and maybe they listen more to you than anybody else in the region. Uh, so that asset needs to be effectively uh, mobilized in support of our uh, common goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Amar? Uh, no, I think there are some questions from... Um, uh, the audience is also okay. Uh, but one question I would just ask: You see, the main demands of Taliban have been sort of met. Their first and sort of consistent demand has been all troops to go, and of course, release of prisoners. We know the substantial amounts has already been released. But we also see that since the uh, agreement was signed in Doha. Uh, the number of attacks have gone up. Actually, it's been uh, consistently around 50 a week. Uh, and there is a feeling, and I, I hold this, that the Doha agreement had an inbuilt tolerance for violence against Afghans because there was no commitment on Taliban uh, against uh, not attacking Afghan forces or Afghan civilians. Uh, their commitment was only towards NATO and US. So. Uh, one sees that result that's playing out. But related with this is the problem that unless we break this regional value chain and unless US and the other partners try to ensure that the sanctuaries and safe havens are denied, uh, Taliban will not have enough incentive to reintegrate. And the third, more critical part is we have seen tendencies that the other groups may be used, uh, Mr. Ratner mentioned, to covert foreign policy 
use of these groups. Uh, does he foresee that there could be spoilers who can use other groups using other flags or names in derailing uh, this process because they don't want uh, a reconciliation in Afghanistan? Um, again, as always, Ambassador, you point to an extremely important issues. Uh, um, one of the things that the Taliban will have to explain to the people of Afghanistan and the world community, that they said their struggle, their fight was for one thing, and that was the departure of foreign troops. We talked to them and we said, okay, we agree with you because we have signed the BSA and so far, and we clearly explained that the foreign troops should leave Afghanistan one day. And we even set a time frame for that and said within two years, when the government of Afghanistan asked them, they should leave. So we said, we are in agreement in the departure of foreign troops. But we also want the departure of foreign fighters from Afghanistan. LAT is not Afghan. TTP is not Afghan, uh, uh, IMU is not Afghan, Al-Qaeda is not Afghan, ISIS, uh, well, maybe some Afghan recruits, but uh, its leadership, its objectives, none of it is Afghan. So they should leave Afghanistan, they should. Uh, so the, the foreign troops departure from Afghanistan and the foreign fighters uh, 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 departure from Afghanistan will have to go together. Uh, to assure regional support for it. But, but put that aside, the other issue is that they said, okay, the departure of foreign troops, now for that they have two things. One, the BSA that we have signed and the SOFA, where the date is defined. And second, they, they signed uh, uh, an agreement with the Americans and, and, and that has also uh, uh, define the time frame, uh, fine. Uh, but the question now is, if they are, uh, they are on the way to achieve that objective and they are no longer fighting the foreign troops, then why are they fighting the Afghans? I mean, they have to explain that to the Afghan people and to the world community. What was this struggle for that they... Uh, 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 justified for, for, for almost two decades to be only focused on, on uh, the foreign troops withdrawal. Now, in Samangan, there is no foreign troops. Uh, in uh, um, um, Herat, uh, in Farah, in uh, Nimruz, uh, maybe uh, in Herat's airport, uh, uh, but, but they are not fighting the foreign troops there, they're fighting Afghan troops in, in Shindan. So the point I am trying to make is that uh, there's absolutely no justification or whatsoever for the current level of violence uh, or violence against Afghans. Now, whether this is the fault of the agreement or the fault of uh, the uh, uh, deliver, uh, Taliban to deliver on that agreement. Uh, uh, it's a lesser issue. The, the main issue is that this is happening uh, at the moment and it will have to be stopped. Uh, that, that is madness. The, the second point is uh, how vulnerable are we even if we achieve peace agreement with Taliban and the Taliban come uh, and, and join the rest of the Afghans, uh, and then we wouldn't see uh, uh, new terrorist groups emerging, uh, recruiting people and continuing to fight. Uh, well, that is exactly our point uh, to make with our international partners, that the end state uh, should uh, reflect commitments not only from Afghans, but also from the regional and international community, that the terrorist industry will have to be dismantled in the region. Yes, the peace between Taliban and the Afghans, 
will weaken it significantly uh, and strengthen Afghans to fight uh, 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 foreign fighters. But there's absolutely no guarantee that that would uh, dismantle the, uh, the, uh, the industry. So it's important again for India, Afghanistan and the United States to work together with our other partners such as China, Russia, uh, Iran uh, and, and uh, regional partners um, um, uh, that we make sure uh, that peace in Afghanistan also means uh, uh, the, the dismantling of, of the terrorist infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Shubangi, I think Amar and I don't want to monopolize the minister. And there, I'm sure there are lots of questions that are coming in from the audience. So why don't you take over uh, and see if sure. in the remaining time we can cover some of those. Sure, sir. Thank you, Ambassador Sood. Uh, we've received uh, lots of interesting questions indeed from the audience. So do allow me to direct some of them to you, uh, Minister Atmar. Uh, so the first one is uh, to do with the you know, the last question that you raised in your uh, just uh, previous remark, that if the Taliban are serious about effecting a peace in Afghanistan, and they want us to believe their commitment to a power sharing deal with the Afghan government, why do they continue to engage in violence on the ground? And then why should we then continue to expect positive developments on the intra-Afghan talks front? Um, would you like to ask two or three, and then I respond, or you want sure. me to respond to each sure. one individually? Maybe we can take uh, maybe two more, and then you can collectively okay. respond to each sure. of them, sir. Thank you. Sure. So there's another one which uh, goes something like this, uh, with suggestions that India has been sidelined from the Chabahar Port Development Project. What hope do you have for India's development assistance to and economic engagement with Afghanistan in future? And how do you see the developing Iran-China relationship affecting Afghanistan's security and its relationship with India? Okay. Um, uh, first on uh, the uh, Taliban uh, desire to share power or uh, uh, be part of uh, uh, an all-Afghan uh, political system based on those core values. Uh, this is the hope we have uh, to achieve through a peace agreement with them. Uh, and that peace agreement will have to be then uh, guaranteed and supported by our regional and international partners. It could also be um, uh, supported and should be supported if we reached it um, uh, uh, by the UN Security Council. Uh, uh, to have, uh, uh, we would expect that other um, uh, uh, regional bodies, including the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, will support that, uh, and uh, the SARC, and and and, and then all of the, the the regional bodies that bring us together for our common good, uh, uh, and hopefully, then uh, the implementation of the agreement will. Uh, have a serious um, uh, uh, support base, uh, and it will not be just left to the ethics to deliver on an agreement. It will be also uh, compulsory to, to uh, 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 implement the agreement. Um, uh, now, uh, we are not asking the Taliban to come and join this ministry or that ministry. Uh, and, and uh, have a power sharing. We are asking them to, let, let's agree on a people-centered uh, 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 political system where the will of the people will determine uh, the future. Uh, and uh, if, if you are representing the will of the people, then you shouldn't be afraid of participating in any democratic process or endeavor to shape our future. Uh, it's not about uh, uh, one temporary power sharing, it's about 
permanent participation and inclusion in a democratic process whereby they don't have to use their guns uh, to achieve their political goals, but use their uh, uh, logic and uh, their appeal uh, uh, to have uh, the will of the people, the vote of the people, uh, and achieve it. Um, uh, second, uh, on the uh, Chabahar issue, I, uh, I believe that India uh, uh, made such a wonderful choice to support the Chabahar uh, initiative. Uh, uh, India is not sidelined. India is, in fact, a leader there. Uh, a leader to uh, 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 start a regional uh, initiative which is not just benefiting India, Iran, Afghanistan, it will benefit the entire region. So India is pretty much uh, 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 at the leadership of the, the initiative with its investment, its thinking, and its relations. Uh, and uh, we should all work together uh, to make the Chabahar uh, um, uh, uh, initiative a success. I know uh, there are uh, two issues there. One is the sanctions issue, and second, the security in Afghanistan. We have to work together. And of course, there are bureaucratic issues uh, in, in the system. Uh, the bureau bureaucratic issues will be definitely resolved. Security and sanctions will have to be discussed. And we need to look at ways in which we can uh, uh, expand the space for Chabahar Initiative to grow. Uh, on the China-Iran uh, 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 investment uh, vision, uh, well, well, first of all, it's too early to, to make any judgment at this point. Uh, second, an integrated uh, a region, both politically and economically, uh, will not be a threat to anybody, hopefully. It will be an integrated region in the interest of uh, everybody. Uh, so I do hope uh, that, uh, and, and we know if, if the region is not integrated, no such initiative will be able to, uh, uh, to take off. Uh, either we work together and benefit together, or there will be no such initiative uh, uh, because of lack of political cooperation will certainly affect the security uh, uh, situation as well as uh, the, the economic perspectives uh, for, for such initiatives. So um, India as a key regional and global emerging power uh, should look at, and I ab I'm absolutely confident that this is the case, uh, at how to mobilize the region around that vision, together with partners like Afghanistan and the United States, uh, uh, so that we are not recipients of uh, um, exclusive policies, but we are the drivers of inclusiveness in the region and at uh, uh, international level. Thank you, Minister Atmar. If you'll allow, I'd like to read out maybe two more questions, uh, which you can again collectively respond to. Um, so the first one is from Brigadier N. K. Bhatia. The security paradigm of Afghanistan is fully dependent on the USA, with the US reducing its strength to 8,500 and closing bases, how do you ensure the security of your country since the Afghan National Army's lack of crucial assets like a formidable air force would be a major constraint in the fight against the Taliban? And there's also a second question from uh, Admiral A.P. Revi. How much cooperation do you expect from the Taliban in evolving an Islamic Republic that conforms to the wishes of the Afghan people as defined by you this afternoon? Over to you, sir. Um, we are having two scenarios potentially here. Scenario one, that the peace process succeeds. And scenario two, that the peace process fails. Uh, now, um, 
if it succeeds, uh, uh, again, there are two sub-scenarios. It succeeds in terms of the end state we Afghan, Afghans wish to have, or the end state of uh, those uh, who are different, uh, wishing a different thing than what we are wishing to have. Um, now, in the first scenario, the, uh, um, uh, I mean, success, again, I, I, I'm not representing an ideological position here, but a practical one. If the end state I described on behalf of the Afghan state and people uh, is not achieved, there won't be any lasting peace in the region because uh, anything contrary to that end state or the imposition of a dictatorship in Afghanistan of whatever nature that might be will not be acceptable to the Afghan people and will not serve the multi-ethnic nature and aspiration of our nation. Second, exactly by the same reasons it will not be acceptable to the region. So we will again have proxy wars and we will again have type of civil wars, no matter who engages or who disengages. So we only have two scenarios. Either the peace process succeeds, which in that case will be the end state uh, uh, that, that we uh, commit ourselves to, or it fails. If it succeeds, the amount of dependence that we have on foreign aid for security will drop significantly, hopefully. And, uh, and the, can, we will have the kind of resources to continue to fight if there are foreign fighters in the country. And hopefully Taliban will be then part of uh, the, the political system of the country. Uh, and there will be nobody to, uh, uh, at least no Taliban uh, to, to host them. Uh, so in that case, the, uh, uh, the significant weakness that we have with uh, certain capabilities uh, will be less felt. Uh, but if it is the second scenario, and the failure of the peace process, uh, then uh, the question for our international partners is, is it really wise to take away those capabilities from Afghanistan? Or should we continue uh, to demonstrate that Afghanistan, the region, and the international community are united in one uh, 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 effort, uh, and that is that they will continue to fight international terrorism and make sure Afghanistan does not become a safe haven uh, for international terrorism. Uh, now, uh, uh, I, I did have a good conversation yesterday with one of my uh, US colleagues who served at a very senior level in the administration. And uh, we both know uh, that uh, 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 together, we need to address the um, uh, Afghanistan's uh, close air support capability that, that we require. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the Afghan National Security Forces uh, are, are critically in need of two things. One is uh, its fiscal sustainment, and second is the absence of certain capabilities, especially close air support. Um, I did mention that uh, uh, fighting international terrorism is a shared responsibility. The Afghans are ready to invest in their blood, and we are hoping that our international partners will continue to be ready to invest with their equipment and financing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Atmar, for, uh, you know, those uh, very comprehensive answers to the questions I posed. Uh, 
do we have time for maybe another question? One more or uh, are we keeping sure. you for longer than? <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so we have a question from uh, Dr. Tara Karta, who's also an academic who, uh, you know, she's been closely following Afghanistan for years now. The question goes something like this. Is China seen as being supportive of the end state that you describe? And can China persuade its friends in the region to subscribe to it as well? Has there been any sign of this so far? What is your take on that, sir? Um, we had a very good uh, uh, trilateral at uh, um, deputy foreign minister's level uh, two weeks ago, uh, China, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And uh, the uh, uh, statement, a uh, press statement that we all three agreed on uh, was exactly supportive of the end state uh, that I described. Um, I hope that we all, all three of us meant it, that this was not just a piece of paper uh, with uh, some uh, rhetorical uh, commitments. I hope these were um, the honest commitments uh, from honest states uh, uh, with uh, responsibility for our common uh, security and prosperity. Uh, if it is not really what we meant, uh, we won't serve the, the goal of our common uh, security interests. Uh, China knows well what threatens its security. China knows well that Afghanistan is a partner to ensure security for the entire region. Afghanistan has demonstrated its sincerity. Uh, let me also uh, say something about uh, our discussion with, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, one thing that we commit ourselves to and have always done that, we will never allow our territories to be used by any state or non-state actor to hurt Pakistan or any other neighbor. And it is our sincere hope that they would reciprocate, that their territories are not used against us. That is the only way forward uh, on achieving uh, common security in the face of common threats. Uh, uh, among those terrorist organizations, there are those that threaten Pakistan. Uh, uh, and when they kill innocent people in Pakistan, we, we have the, exactly the same feeling as we have for our own people. Uh, uh, so we will never support any kind of terrorism uh, with, with any objective in any place in the world. And that is exactly the kind of standard we hope that our partners in the region, all of them, uh, will uh, uh, perform by um, and, and, and stand by. So I am optimistic uh, that because uh, the combined effect of terrorism in the region uh, has had, unfortunately, negative consequences for all of the countries in the region. Maybe the degree is different, but the negative consequences have been felt by every nation in the region. I hope that will become a ground for our cooperation. That is one way that we all benefit, and that is our honest uh, and multilateral cooperation against our common uh, threats. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Minister Atmar, for joining us this afternoon and very graciously enlightening us with critical insights on the theme. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us, sir. I would also like to thank Ambassador Sood and Ambassador Sinha for participating in the session and for their sharp interventions. 
Thank you again for a truly enriching discussion, Minister Atmar, and we look forward to engaging with you again at ORF in future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, my dear ambassadors. Thank you. Thank you. to see you in Afghanistan soon. And, Inshallah. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to all of our colleagues who, who joined us today. Thank you.